Um, hi, everybody. I'm Christoph Pettis. Um, I am the CEO of PostgreSQL Experts. We're a small Postgres consultancy based in Alameda, California. People know where that is. Um, here's email address. That's my tech, my personal tech blog, and my Twitter account. Um, the inevitable question, and that's that's my cursor. What, what are you doing there? Um, the um, the inevitable question is, will the slides be up? And, and in fact, they are up at thebuild.com. Questions are welcome, but if you ha this is not a particularly contentious talk or anything, but if your question begins, it's more of a comment. Um, maybe save it for the hallway track later. Thank you. OK. Um, so this is a survey. This is not a deep dive into any particular replication technology. Um, but Postgres has a lot of different replication technologies now. And there's kind of this question of, well, that's great. What do I use when? And what are their trade-offs? And that's what we're going to be talking about now. Um, there's, as general classes, there's wall shipping, string replication, trigger-based replication, logical decoding-based replication as of more recent versions. And there are a few exotic animals that we'll talk about, mostly to tell you don't stick your hand in the cage. Um, OK. so. This is kind of basic stuff for Postgres, but it's worth going over again because this informs a lot of the other things. Who feels they understand the right ahead lock? Okay, great audience for this talk then. Um, the right ahead log has been in Postgres for a long time. It's not unique to Postgres. Pretty much every production database system has a right ahead log. Even SQLite does a right ahead log now. Um, it, because it's sort of the standard way that you pick up a computer science book and say, how am I going to do crash recovery in a database? And the first thing they'll tell you is, well, implement a write-ahead log already. It's a continuous stream of database changes that are written to local storage. So it consists of a series of records, in Postgres's case, and each a specific change to a specific underlying disk level item. Um, so sometime if, you're, um, if you've never done this, log into your Postgres database and say, select CTID from table from some table, and you'll get a list of numbers, of, of, parent, of, two, of two of pairs of numbers, even though you, you didn't know you had a column CTID. Um, that's the, basically the disk address of that particular row of the database. Um, that's what disk page, Postgres disk page it's on, and that's which offset into the disk page. So that's disk page, you know, one, two, blah, blah, tuple number six. And this is the object ID of the relation. So this is the underlying way Postgres thinks about your database, numerically. Um, in Postgres's case, these are, all of these changes are broken up into a series of 16 megabyte segments, which are given big unpleasant hexadecimal file names and written to disk this way. You can change the 16 megabytes by recompiling Postgres. No one ever does this. Probably don't do it because there are tools that will get very confused because they have the 16 megabytes hardwired into themselves. So the reason we do this was originally to provide crash recovery. Um, <clears throat> on startup, Postgres, if Postgres sees that it crashed and therefore it, it's not sure what the on-disk state of the database is, it goes back to the last wall segment that contained the last checkpoint and just redoes what it did before. The idea is when it gets to the end of the wall, it says, OK, I'm done. I'm back to the state I was. Um, and then it will, when it reaches a consistent state, the database starts up again in connections. It'll even tell you, give a happy little message in the, law, in the text log saying that it did this. So then there was this bright idea. Well, OK, we have the database, and we're recording every change we make to it and putting it in a file somewhere. But what if we had an exact copy of that database and applied the changes to both of them? That's an interesting idea. So what if the, the original system was still in operation? This wasn't a crash scenario. It was just going along and generating its wall segments. And then we took the wall segments and we said, OK, now you apply them too to this other machine that started at the same disk image. And then we could replay all these wall segments on a different system and would keep up to date with the system that was generating these wall segments, which we will call, for purposes of this talk, the primary. And this was such a good idea, we came up with wall shipping. Uh, the version 8 of Postgres introduced wall shipping. So the way wall shipping works is these 16 megabyte files I talked about, every time one's done, which generally means it's full, 
you know, reach the end of the 16 megabytes, or there was a checkpoint, or you called the, P, the there's a function in Postgres that you can, set, you can force it to finish a new wall segment, uh, an old wall segment and generate a new one. It runs a command called archive command. This is in your postgresql.conf. Archive command can do anything it wants, but really there's only one thing it should do, which is take that wall segment and copy it to a different place. Where the, other, where the secondary machine can get at it. Now, this could be, a, this can be anywhere. You know, it can be at S3. It could be a, on, a, on a shared disk. It could be a lot of places. But the, the, rule, the, only, the only thing that it has to be is the secondary machine, the one that's keeping up, needs to be able to get at it. And then the secondary re repeatedly runs restore command, which is in this file recovery.conf, which um, is what you use to control Reco um, recovery. This is the, the, if anyone's wondered why this is called recovery.conf, this is why. It's all based on the same system that crash recovery uses. So restore command just repeatedly says, do you have a new wall segment for me? No. Do you have a new wall segment for me? No. Okay. And then finally, yes, re applies the wall segment and goes back to waiting for it. And this works really well. And for a long time, this was the only binary form of, rec of replication we had. Um, the good part about this is it's cheap and cheerful to set up. You just need to be able to copy files around. You know, rsync, scp, whatever. You probably want rsync because scp is an atomic. Um, so, and sometimes Postgres will get confused if it tries to do a recovery when the first eight megabytes of the 16 megabyte file have arrived. Um, one thing that's nice, and this is useful to this day, even though there, there have been new replication technologies have appeared, it only needs, it doesn't need a persistent connection between the primary and the secondary. It just needs to pick up a file and ship it over. This is very helpful where you have bad connections. They're either slow, they're unreliable, you have a terrible LAN, you know, whatever. Um, so, because you don't have to keep a TCP IP connection open all the time, just when you're shipping this file across. And if you, ha you can use this as the basis for point in time recovery because you don't have to be constantly applying these files. You can kind of let them build up for a while in some, you know, have this big pile of wall files and this very old base backup and say, I want to recover, but I want to recover to 3 p.m. yesterday. And you put that option in your recovery.conf and Postgres dutifully will re replay all the wall segments, but stop at that point. That's very handy for forensic, like you got hacked, uh, somebody, a DBA issued a drop table command thinking they were on staging, but they were actually on production. Not that I've ever done that. Um, and so, so it's, you know, very, it's, a, it's a very handy technique. And, it, the, and if you're running a version before 9.0, it's your only option for binary replication, so you might as well use it. But you shouldn't be running a version before 9.0. I hope you aren't. So <clears throat> one of the nice things about Postgres, one of its great features that people just kind of accept and I don't think fully understand how cool it is, is DDL changes are wall logged. When you do a create table, that's wall logged like everything else is. It's transactional, it can be rolled back, it's great. So when you, do a, when you are using wall shipping and you do a change on the primary, they're pushed down to the secondary automatically. You don't have to do anything special to keep the, sequ the, the schemas in sync. Um, Allowing for replication lag, the secondary is a perfect mirror. Any change that happens on the primary is going to happen on the secondary. Um, and if you set it up right by setting the right parameters, you can send read and queries to the secondary. So you have to be aware of replication lag, of course, because these changes are not being applied instantly, but it works great. And if the primary dies, failover is really easy. You just promote the secondary. It, often, it usually takes less than a minute. Sometimes it's almost instantaneous. So failover is really, really fast. Usually rehoming the application to point to the new database server is what takes all the time. But there's some bad things. The secondary is only as up to date as that last 16 megabyte wall segment, because so you can lose changes. If you're halfway through one of these 16 megabyte segments and an asteroid smashes through and destroys your primary, you probably have other things to think about, but you also have lost the last eight megabytes of that of, of changes because they haven't been shipped over yet. Um, wall segments are a great way of running yourself out of disk space because they're picked up and copied from the primary to the secondary, and the secondary has to uh, manage them, or wherever whatever storage system you're using 
has to manage them. There's, um, there is a cleanup command that Postgres can run on the secondary that deletes them, but you have to do that. There's also a failure mode, which is common and very embarrassing, which is the secondary stops running, and the archive cleanup command there's, therefore stops running. These files are being shipped over and they're piling up. And then that, the disk space fills up on the secondary. Now the archive command on the primary starts failing because there's no space left on the secondary to ship this over. Postgres, if it gets an error on the archive command, doesn't recycle that wall segment. It hangs on to it because it hasn't archived it. You might need it for something. And so now disk space is filling up on the primary. So you can run yourself out of this space in a lot of interesting ways using this. So you just have to manage that and monitor your disk space. If, you're, if you have multiple secondaries, you have to do some orchestration here because all of these secondaries need the wall segment. So you either have to copy them to the, all the secondaries or you have to store them in a centralized location. Um, now that we have centralized storage, we have storage subsystems like S3 and things like that, this has been made much easier. This isn't as big a problem as it used to be. But so if you're using Wally or Wall G or one of these, it kind of handles this stuff for you. Um, you can't write to the secondary at all, including temporary tables, which a lot of analytical packages like to do. You can't create new views. You can't do anything. It's an exact mirror image, and it has to stay that way. Um, there are some other things that are maybe good, maybe bad. If it's a failover candidate, it's not so bad. But if you're trying to do analytics and things like this, it may not be so great. It's an exact mirror image, so you can't pick and choose what you copy. All the databases, all the tables, everything across the entire cluster has to be, have to be copied. You don't have any other choices. You have to replicate all the fields and all the columns and all the tables and all the databases, everything. And you can't consolidate multiple servers down to a single data warehouse using this because it's a one to, it's, you know, a many, it's a one to many relationship. You can't feed multiple things into it. Um, and this is a, that, a big bummer. You can't replicate between different major versions of Postgres. You can minor, it works for minor versions, although probably not the best idea in the world. But if you want to use, you can't use it for version upgrades. So you can't go from 9.6 to 10 or from, you know, 9.3 to 9.7 and 9.6, whatever. So, okay, well, then there was the second bright idea, the second light bulb appeared. Well, what if we didn't ship these files? What if we just opened the TCP IP connection and just pumped the data down? Well, that meant the secondary could stay a lot closer to the primary because you're not waiting for a 16 megabyte wall segment to be fi uh, filled up. You're getting record after record after record. That's great. And that's, what's all, that's really all to a first approximation streaming replication is. It's the same wall information, only it's transmitted down to the secondary over t directly rather than by shipping a file around. Um, that recovery.com file has the information necessary to point it, the, pri the secondary at the primary, to open the, the, open the connection and do all that stuff. Um, secondary, the secondary initiates the connection, and then the primary feeds the information down to it. Um, oops. And... Otherwise, the same as wall shipping. For some reason, my slide doesn't want to stick there. Um, so the good parts are, compared to wall shipping, the secondary stays pretty close to the primary, often you know, within milliseconds of it, because it's getting the information in real time, in more or less in real time. Um, you can turn on optional synchronous replication, and this can be turned on on a server-by-server -server basis or even on a transaction-by-transaction -transaction basis. And the chance, this reduces the law, the, to pretty much zero the chance of a lost transaction. What synchronous replication does is wait for an acknowledgment back from the secondary that says, I have committed this to disk. M more recent versions of Postgres have all sorts of exotic things you can do. You can do quorum commit where you say three out of five of them have committed it and all that kind of thing. So it is, however, of course, a performance hit because you have to wait for these acknowledgments back. So turning it on globally across the entire system, maybe not such a great idea. But if what you're processing is ATM transactions, maybe it is. Um, you can cascade replicas. So you can have a, a, a primary and a tertiary. And you know, I think the most I've ever seen is like over 300. You know, just somebody wrote a script that just took like four minutes for one of the data to propagate around. But you know. Knock yourself out. I'm sure someone's running that in production right now for some, for some reason. Um, both of these techniques have some weirdnesses, though, so that you should be aware of. The first is replication delay. So 
when a wall change comes into the secondary, and that secondary um, is run, this is different for replication lag, just to be clear. Replication lag is just the intrinsic delay that it takes the data to come across the wire and be pounded onto the disk. But this is something that's more or less specific to Postgres. When a wall change comes into relation to the secondary, that secondary is running query that uses that relation, what should we do? What we mean by that is, remember these are page level changes. They're below the SQL level. They're not transactional as such. So a query could be running and a replication change could come in and sort of like rewrite the data underneath that query, which would invalidate the results of that query. And thus the query would return an incorrect value. But that's, so that's, the, that's not acceptable. So we, w there are two things we could do in this case. We could just delay applying the change, you know, put up a wall and say stop the replication stream, let the query finish, return the result, and now go. Or we could cancel the query. We could see that the, 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 the data, we see the data coming in saying, oh, that doesn't look good. Issue a cancellation to the, uh, to the client. The client gets an error back. Data is applied, and then the client goes, oh, one of these again, and reruns the query. What happens here in Postgres is controlled by parameters in PostgresQL.conf. This is the first thing that this, pretty much everybody who sets up stream replication, we get this email from a client that says, we're getting these query cancellation messages. Ah, what do we do? And we have to explain this to them. Um, so they're different for, you can do one, one's for stream replication, one's for wall shipping, and they control how long to hold the wall stream before canceling the query. So higher settings mean more potential replication lag. Because if you set it to like five minutes, it will hold the wall stream for five minutes, but the primary could, the secondary could fall five minutes behind the primary, which is not great if this is what this was meant to really do is fail over. Um, so my advice in this case is if, you're, if you are using streaming replication for failover, which you probably should be, dedicate a server just for those with these set to zero so it stays as close as possible to the primary. And if you want to have other secondaries that do read write, that have read only traffic for uh, load balancing from the primary, set them to higher values. You can set them to negative one, which means effectively infinity. It will hold, hold the replication for as long as it needs to. So vacuum. So there's this vacuum changes pages in Postgres. I'm not going to go into details of vacuum because we could be here all day talking about vacuum, but the, uh, the va when the primary wakes up and starts vacuuming tables, that generates a lot of page changes. You know, it starts recovering space and marking things as frozen and all sorts of crazy stuff. And so it's shipping all these page changes down to the secondaries, which means the secondary, even though it doesn't really, there's really no write activity that, you know, in the terms of queries on the primary, suddenly the, qu the secondary is like canceling queries left and right because of all these page changes coming in. This parameter was added to reduce that. If you set it to on, the secondary will send a message up to the primary saying, I need this table right now. Could you please not vacuum it? Um, and it will then do that. It will defer vacuuming those to avoid query cancellations on the secondary. And it works great. In fact, it can work a little too great. Because if you have a table that you're querying a lot on the secondary, this feedback keeps coming up, and that table never gets vacuumed. And it can bloat pretty badly. And this is a real problem. We have, you know, this has been observed in the wild. Um, so do, be, do understand there are consequences on using this. And of course, it doesn't completely eliminate query cancellations because if someone actually modifies a table, doing an, an update or an insert or something, that can still cause a query cancellation. So in general, it's a good idea, but monitor bloat if you're doing a lot of reads on a secondary. There's also this um, vacuum defer cleanup age. Just don't bother setting it anymore. It's impossible to tune. Don't worry about it. Pretend it doesn't exist. Okay. Moving right along. Um, so stream replication had a lot of great things, but it also had a bunch of limitations. Like before version 8, it didn't exist. Um, and it, it now, it still has all these problems like you can't consolidate data, you can't subselect from it, you can't do any of that stuff. So well, how will we solve this problem? And the answer is trigger-based replication. Hooray. So you know, there are a lot of restrictions, no selectivity. It has to be the same major version, so you can't use it for a version upgrade, all sorts of problems. But Postgres has this really elaborate trigger mechanism. Hmm. 
Well, that's interesting. You, know, you can detach triggers that do all sorts of wacky things to your Postgres tables. Um, so what if we attach a trigger to each table, caught update, insert, and delete operations, and push them secondary that way? You could like write a trigger function that said, OK, before I apply this, I'm going to go scroll it away in the secondary table, and then apply it. And then a daemon somewhere will pick it up from that table and walk it across. And ta-da. The author of one of the first versions of this is sitting in the front row. <laughs> um, the, um, yes, we could do that. We have done this. Um, so it actually predated wall-based replication in the form of Sloney 1. Um, so now we have Sloney, written in C, Lundis, which is written in Python, uh, part of Skype tools, Bucardo, which is written in Perl, um, and there are some others that basically work the same way. You know, th this, is, this is not a unique idea to anybody. So the good part about this is um, you're a lot, a lot more flexibility. It's just code. It can do whatever you want. Um, you know, depending on the particular package, each one has their own gives and takes. Um, you can replicate only some databases. This is pretty much everybody. Replicate only some tables. That's also pretty much everybody. So only some fields. You can filter changes with rules. So you say, I want to do replication, but I only want to replicate based on this predicate, you know, where, where clause, things like that. Um, you can build really exotic topologies with these. You can merge things and consolidate databases and do all this fun stuff. Um, Bucardo, unique among these, does multi-master replication. So you can have two databases that are two, two ta the same table, you know, schema conceptually, on two different databases that are replicating to each other. So, um, which, is, which is handy if you have like geographically distributed things but want to keep everybody up to date. Um, you can use, and it will work between different major versions of Postgres. So you can use it for near zero downtime up, um, upgrading. Overall, the process takes a long time because you fire up both servers, replicate, 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 wait till they're in sync, declare a maintenance window, stop the app, rehome it to the, the new version, bring it back up again. But the total downtime as far as the app's concerned is very, very small. But for this, we pay. Um, these are, frankly, tedious and fiddly to set up. Some are easier, some are harder. The more you do it, the easier it gets. But none of them are pain-free. Um, every table that's going to be replicated needs a primary key at least a de facto one. Th this is a little bit of an overstatement. If all you're doing is inserts, you don't need a primary key because you don't need to identify rows. But if you're doing delete and update operations where you have to identify rows, it needs to be able to identify a row somehow. So that generally means a primary key or the entire value of the, f of the row, which is usually very costly. Um, the initial copies can take a long time. You know, you have to build the new database to receive this stuff. and. Um, they t it's a little bit of an awkward fit for wall-based replication if you're doing failover, because you ha you know each one has a secondary, and then the pri the tar uh, target fails, and you have to rehome all of this and make sure that you got the changes over, and it's not easy. Um, nothing's free, you know. All these triggers you're firing all the time, and the log tables, and all this stuff that has a real performance impact. So you because you, you are effectively writing everything twice. And no automatic DDL change distribution, that's on you. So you have to figure, you, generally, there, most of them provide some level of um, tooling that you can say, apply all these DDL changes, but it won't do it automatically. You have to remember to do that. Um, of them all, Slo Sloney tends to be the highest performance because it's written in C, plugs directly in, very nice. Um, but that requires C language extensions, so you have to be on an environment that can handle those. Um, Lundis requires Python PLU, so you know most, you know, no big deal if it's your own server. Um, Bucardo can work entirely outside the subscriber but not provider system, so it's good for RDS where you can't create new extensions if they didn't give them to you already. Um, Bucardo also supports multi-master um, and changing the primary key on a row, so that's nice. It, you know. For a long time, this was the only game in town, and it was a very nice solution. We now have modern, more recent um, logical replication tools. So bl bluntly, if you can use those, use those instead. That is, that's the future here. Um, 
if you're upgrading from a version before 9.4, these are still super useful for doing zero downtime or near zero downtime upgrades. And sometimes you need them, these for specialized environments like RDS where you aren't able to just create extensions. Um, <clears throat> until very recently, RDS didn't support in-core logical replication in any super useful way. So who's running on RDS, by the way? How about Aurora? Interesting. Okay, just curious. Okay. So now, now the, the, this is the, the modern world. We need, like, you know, UFOs and, yeah. this is, um, so logical decoding first came into version 9.4. Not many people really took note of it because it was a very basic implementation. The thing about logical decoding is streaming replication basically comes out of the box. You know, the packing peanuts fall off. You plug the two servers together, and it works. Um, logical decoding is some assembly required. It's actually a framework. It's not a single implementation the way streaming replication is. It really required 9.6 before people, like, kind of got going. Um, so the, the, there's a framework, the logical decoding framework takes these wall records that are being generated and kind of reverses them back into SQL-ish operations. So it kind of does this. Um, if so, you know, the actual implementation is quite a bit different, but for purposes of this talk, it's, this is not too far off. So when, when it says update the field of this CTID, this relation to cat, you kind of get this back. You know, it says, OK. This is an update operation. So here's your update operation. And it feeds it into the framework. And the framework, it's up to the framework to deal with it. It doesn't, now to, to be clear, it doesn't actually re rec reconstruct the actual SQL. And it doesn't build actual SQL strings. But the data is higher level than the lower level page change. Along with logical replication, we got this thing replication slots. Um, it's a named database object that captures the wall stream. You, you know, basically, it's you plug into the side of your Postgres database and say, I'd like a stream of wall changes, please. And that's called a replication slot. So it's an outlet on the side of your database. Once it's created, the framework just says, OK, you want changes? I've got changes for you. And just starts feeding it these changes. And it feeds them into the plugin, and it's up to the plugin to decide what to do with them. You can do anything it wants with them. Um, and the plugin then reports back up to the framework, says, OK, that change, I'm done with it. And that's the way the framework knows it can throw away the wall information and all that stuff. So <clears throat> the problem with this is it, um, the replication um, slot, once it starts, it remembers where in the wall stream it's gotten to. And it tells the framework, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. If that, if that consumer, if that plug-in to the wall replication slot it just, um, stops consuming, the framework just says, oh, OK, I'll hang on to all the wall information until you're back forever, if necessary. So this results in the wall segments not being recycled. So we have a whole new way of running yourself out of disk space. So just be aware when you create this replication slot, it's kind of your responsibility to make sure the whole end-to-end -end framework is working. You know, so monitor, 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 monitor. So the, this plugin I keep talking about, it's just a little bit of C code that some human being wrote and attached to the Postgres server as an extension. And it receives the stream of decoded wall records. It can do anything it wants with them. It can log them. It can do auditing. It can feed them to an external data system. Like this is, this is one that feeds it into Kafka, if you're into Kafka. Um, Postgres ships with a test plugin, but it's not really good for much except as an example. It's, just, it, it, you know, it's, a, it's a perfectly good example, but it doesn't do anything that you'd actually want to do in production. So human beings then had to scurry off and write these plugins, and we have a few now. So on Postgres 10 and higher, we have built-in logical replication, um, which is based on this framework. On 9.4 and higher, we have a plugin that was uh, written by the people at Second Quadrant called um, PG Logical that also does logical replication. You can find it there. So the high level view is it takes these changes, turns them back into SQL, 
and applies them at the SQL level. Um, so this means that this means you get all the same stuff. It's not like streaming replication where it's writing the disk the disk level format directly. It constraints are enforced, rows are locked, triggers can fire, um, multi-version concurrency control happens. It's just like it really is just like you were running the SQL statements on the other server. Um, a single database can be both a publisher and a subscriber of changes. These databases are not in a special recovery mode. They're just primary databases like any Postgres database. And a single table can be both a source and a target. They can't point to each other, however. You can't, right now, there's no, right, right now, using standard open source tools, you can't do bidirectional replication to the same table. Can't. So the general setup is, generally, you use PG dump or whatever you want to make a copy to get the initial data across. Um, when one of these tools, both these tools work in basically the same way, so I'm kind of like talking about them in the same breath. They do have some differences we'll talk about. The, these tools being logical, built-in logical replication and PG logical. When it first connects, it can do an initial bulk copy followed by replication going forward. So that way you know, you know you're at the right point in the data stream. And DDL, cha but, uh, DDL changes are not automatically propagated. PG Logical provides a tool to distribute them for you. Um, InCore Logical Replication says, hope you write something, because we're not going to do it. Ultimately, it will, but it doesn't right now. <clears throat> In order to do this replication, rows need to have an identity. You need, if, you're, if you're just doing inserts, it doesn't matter. But if you're updating and deleting rows on another database, you have to be able to say which row. After all, there's nothing inherent in Postgres that requires that every row have a unique identity. You can have a whole table full of ones, you know, if you want. Um, a primary key or unique index is the ideal situation here. Um, PG Logical requires either a primary key or a single unique index. This restriction is being lifted in version 3, but version 3 is not out yet. Um, in core logical replication can use the entire row value as the identity if, if, ever, if all else fails. Um, this assumes, first of all, that every row with all fields across it are unique and that you're willing to um, have this thing run really, 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 really slowly. This, it has to do a sequential search across the entire table every time you do one of these. <clears throat> so one problem with replica logical replication right now are sequences because sequences are not pushed across the logical replication stream. The row values that you set using them are of course. So if you set a primary key off of a sequence, that primary key will be propagated, but the max value of the, the sequence currently is not automatically distributed to logical replicas. Um, PG Logical has a background process that kind of once in a while wakes up and resets all the sequences across everything, which is better than nothing. Uh, In-core replication says, well, that's a shame. Um, if you're consolidating to a, this mostly will come up if you have multiple servers consolidating to a single table. Um, you can use disjoint ranges or non-sequential keys, like, you know, Snowball is a common or Snowflake um, is a common one for this. Um, UUIDs, also, you know, or big random numbers, whatever. Um, I like UUIDs myself. Um, <clears throat> because of this. Logical replicas right now are really not suitable for failover because the sequences could be out of whack compared to the, where the, they were on the primary. So you still want streaming replication as your main failover technique. If you use truncate, it's a little rough right now in logical replication. In-core replication doesn't, rep, doesn't replicate truncate at all. It just doesn't happen. Um, PG Logical replicates truncate, but doesn't cascade truncate cascades. So you can end up with weird key violations if you, or attempts to create weird key violations. Uh, so just be aware of that, kind of a shame. Um, right now in both PG Logical and in um, InCore, you can only replicate from a real table to a real table. So for example, materialized views, views, foreign tables, partitioned root tables, all kinds of stuff that is not that look like tables but aren't really tables cannot be the source or the target for replicate for logical replication right now. Uh, PG Logical 3 has some kind of cool improvements here, and I you know there will be improvements, further improvements in, in InCore as well. Um, if you're using Postgres 10's built-in partitioning, which you should be, it's super cool. 
Um, the root table is not a real table, which means it can't participate in logical replication either as a source or a destination, which is kind of a shame because having a table that is not partitioned on the source of a logical replica but is partitioned on the destination, like for example a data warehouse, is a pretty common use case. So unfortunate, but there you are. Um, I haven't actually tried this, but, you, but if you're using old style partitioning, using where you set it up more or less yourself, you should be able to do this with in core logical replication. So if you're feeling like bleeding edge, you can try this. I, haven't, I have, just need to build a test case. It uses the write ahead log. But, you know, logical replication is the, lo is, is the write ahead log reversed out into more SQL like operations. So it, doesn't, it can't replicate temporary or unlogged tables because those don't generate any wall information. Um, if you do a copy, that's broken into individual inserts. So if you copy 10 million records in, what it's going to get on the other side is 10 million inserts. So just be aware of that. Um, individual statements are unrolled. So if you do an update that touches 5 million rows, 5 million updates over the wire, have fun. You know, update equivalents. Um, so which should you use? Because you still, because um, you get, there's in-core and PG Logical. PG Logical does have a bunch of features that um, in-core does not. Um, it has flexible conflict handling, so if you, do, if you um, do, do an operation that works on the primary for logical replication, but on the target, it gets an error of some kind, like a duplicate key violation or something like that, in-core just stops and says, throws an error and stops the replication stream until you figure out what you want to do. Um, PG Logical has more op options as to how that will happen. Um, it does the sequence replication. You can do row and col column filtering on PG Logical. PG Logical, has to, you have to build and install an extension. It's not part of the core distribution. Um, and you know, if, if, you have taste, if you have a taste in this matter, InCore uses SQL level statements. PG Logical is a bunch of functions. Probably don't care about that. Um, a primary node, only a primary node can be a logical re uh, publisher, a primary node in the streaming replication sense. So, if you're, so now we're combining streaming replication and logical replication because we're feeling very bold. Um, only a primary node can be a publisher or a subscriber. The subscriber part is obvious because you, you're changing the database and you can't change the subscriber, uh, a secondary. But um, a secondary can't be a publisher in logical replication either because you can't create a logical replication slot on it. Um, right now, the, if the primary fails and you bring up the secondary, you have to recreate the logical replication slots and they don't remember where they are in the logical replication stream. So you can have synchronization problems because of data that the, the, because the secondary is that it doesn't really know where it was at. Everybody agrees this is a big problem. Um, the, um, so for example, there might be changes on the streaming secondary that haven't been pushed down to logical subscribers. You know, if, for, if you have like secondary, streaming secondaries off of your target machine on, so you have to be aware of this. Um, I should update this slide because now we're in beta on Postgres 11 and we haven't addressed this. So maybe Postgres 12 will address this. Um, if you're on RDS, um, if you're on RDS versus 10, your logical replication options are somewhat limited. Um, RDS supports this weird kind of quirky set of logical replication plugins. It's kind of an odd collection. Um, it, specifically, what it doesn't have is any kind of generalized table-to-table -table replication. They all have, t they all have Postgres to some oddball thing. Um, now, but Postgres 10 is now available, and it does support in-core logical replication. So if you're on Postgres 10 on RDS, you do have, you do have in-core logical replication available to you. Okay, so there are just a few exotic animals I want to cover about, you know, how this stuff works. Um, PG Pool 2. Um, if you go into PG Pool 2 and look around for replication, there'll be this thing called statement-based replication, where PG Pool 2 takes, the, takes a query and can split it and apply the same statement to two different servers. Um, so you can have two different machines and, and basically the same front end stream of, of SQL operations are being applied to both. Please do not use this feature because it's very easy for it to break. 
one, one, mis one mistake and everything gets out of sync and you're battling errors forever. It, it, this, this was introduced back in the days when replication was kind of a comp with replication options in Postgres were much more limited. Um, Amazon has a tool called the Data Migration Service, which on Postgres is based on logical decoding. Um, it's really intended for migration between different database systems like Oracle to Postgres or this, that, and the other thing. Um, it doesn't support some important Postgres types, like it doesn't support timestamp TZ. Um, so I hope you're using timestamp TZ if you're using times at all. So that's kind of unfortunate. Um, it's really not great for Postgres to Postgres replication. That really isn't its target feature. Um, second quadrant, bidirectional replication. Um, and it shares, shares many similarities to BG Logical because it is in fact built on the same code. Um, it's currently a closed source proprietary product. In the future it will be open sourced. But if you need bidirectional replication and you want, you don't mind going with a proprietary product, talk to Second Quadrant. Um, specifically, its, its unique selling point is it can do bidirectional multi-master replication and not just point to point, but grid across a grid. So if you have you know, a server in each continent and they all need to replicate to each other, it can do that. Um, there are lots of commercial solutions that do replication out there. They're pretty much all trigger-based um, because they're you know, they're one code base with plugins for each major database product. Um, they're generally mo useful as a package solution for um, database to database product migration. They're really not intended as, um, you know, for going Postgres to Postgres, there are much better options than a lot of these. So, long talk, what's the answer? If you're doing, for, if the primary reason you want a second server is for failover, if the primary goes down, just use streaming replication, you're done. Um, if you want to also have read-only queries, do those to other um, streaming replicas that you don't need for failover so the query cancellation problem isn't a problem for you. If you need logical replication, unless you need a PG logical feature, use in core. It's, it's, it's the wave of the future. And that's it. Thank you. I'll leave this one up. Yeah. I keep thinking there's another bullet after that one. So, questions? Yes, sir. How bad is the uh, performance of the of the logical of logical replication in view that they're generating inserts, inserts, updates, and deletes? Well, the, uh, that was a, um, there's a little bit of an oversimplification there. Really, what they're sending over is it's it's you know, opcode, opcode, pack data, pack data, and then it goes into the SPI on the other side. So it doesn't, ha it's like not being parsed and planned and executed on the, yeah. Because I know at one point, Sloney was, Sloney was parsed, you had a heavy, heavy overload from parses. Well, it's, it's, it's for, it, it never, it never has to actually parse SQL. It never got, it gets feed into the, fed into the partial level. Um, it actually, <laughs> um, PG Logical version 3, you can do that if you want to, but you don't have to. And, and there are actually reasons to do that if, for example, you're going into a partition set. Because if, if you're inserting into the top level partition, you have to go through the parser so it can plan out the, which, which, uh, which one to go into. So that's actually a cool feature, not a terrible one. PG Logical does not, is certainly not as performant as streaming replication, for sure, 100%, no question. Um, it's not bad, though. You know, it's, it's, um, I, w I would not use it as a pure failover solution, even if all the other problems were fixed, because it's, you're not going to stay as close to it, as, as close on the primary. Yes, sir. Did I understand correctly that you can do a streaming replication uh, with uh, PG Logical? Well, um, PG, you can do, there's no, there's nothing built in that says you can't do that. You can have a single, um, a, a single machine can both be a primary, so it can be both a primary for streaming replication and a source machine, a publisher for PG Logical. The second, a secondary in streaming replication can't be a publisher or a subscriber in logical replication. Because, um, and if you have, um, but both publishers and as long as it's a writable database, which in the case of logical replication, both publishers and subscribers are writable databases. Those can be sources, uh, primaries for streaming replication. The the um, the issue comes up is let's say you have this graph and you know you have two pri you have a two uh, a, a logical replication 
publisher, subscriber, and each of those have streaming replication secondaries. And one of them dies. So now you want to move and you promote this one. The question, the, there's a bit of information that we don't, we don't know how to capture just yet, which is what stuff haven't I sent to that secondary, that's logical secondary? That's where the issue arises. So it's an operational issue, it's not a prohibition. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. I, there are so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are your base replications only used specifically to, to replicate and focus on Microsoft? Yeah, I mean, there, there are plenty of, for, if you're going between database products, you know, it's often better to get one of these solutions. Um, you'll get, get this kind of thing, or DMS, or any of those other kinds. DMS is a little, is, has some interesting limitations. The main function of DMS is to get you into Amazon. Um, but, um, it's where if you're doing Postgres to Postgres, they're usually, yeah, the commercial solutions usually, you know. Yeah. And your, and your question? The question was for the wall Uh huh. Is there any kind of validation that the file before the file was. Well, the wall's checksummed, so, you, so if, it, if it's a flat out corruption, that, that it probably won't be an issue. And because, um, because it's based on the continuously increasing XID, it, you, um, it, it, won't, it, you, it won't skip a file and blow everything up or anything like that. You know, it, it's, it is, well, let's put it this way. 20 years of working with Postgres, I've seen a lot of problems, and I've never seen a database corrupted because it picked up bad wall information from the wall stream. So it's pretty integrate. So does that answer your question? Any other questions? Excellent. Thank you so much.